it's really great to be here with all of you. Um, thank you for letting me come and participate with you. And it's, I, I feel like I'm coming to a big family reunion when I come to these. And um, it's very humbling to be here with you. And I, I feel grateful and honored to be in your presence. So Mary keeps talking about how Robin, uh, both of us are going to be talking today. I, I'm sorry to tell you that Robin really isn't going to be talking very much, but she's going to be my assistant here and, and help. He's lovely assistant. He's, she's going to be my lovely assistant. And, you know, I, I'm not one to pass up uh, anything that Mary provides, right? I like to make use of the resources that uh, she's, uh, she's given us. And uh, so some of you noticed that we received some gifts yesterday, and, and we're going to make use of these, okay? So... So, was I the only one that received one of these in my packet? Did everybody get one? So, yesterday, the question was asked to me is, has any progress been made? I have, you know, published proof that, that uh, progress has been made. And uh, many of these uh, articles, uh, the, of the nine articles, we've had a small part in, and I could probably spend all of my time talking about each one of those individually. So. We're not going to really talk about all of that. I'm just going to give you some of the highlights. But if you're interested, look through these articles. Okay? And if you have questions, find one of the specialists, right? Not necessarily the experts, because you guys are the experts, but some of the specialists that have been involved with this, and, and you can ask them. Okay, so my name is uh, Roger Casper, and I'm at Transderm. I also have an appointment at Stanford, so we do a lot of work with them, and I'll talk a little bit more about the collaborative um, uh, nature of this project. But I, as I, I, I did a lot of thinking trying to decide what I should talk about. And, and I thought about you know the great thinkers of the, the uh, ages, and, and here we have the thinker from Rodin, right? And uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a lot of really great thinkers just pondering this and coming up uh, uh, with the uh, What's the best path forward? Okay, and it made me think about some of the great thinkers, and not only thinkers, but uh, doers of our time. So, okay, all right. I, I want you to know. So, Andrea, who I, I had Andrea, who works with us at Transform, do this, and she was quite concerned about the modesty. So, um, you know, she put a little. Skirt on, right? Skirt, and you know, made sure she was stylish with her her pearl necklace, and and you know what Mar Mary thinks of constantly is how do we accomplish our goals? How do we how do we get to where we want to be, uh, uh, and and help uh, PC folks? And a number of of you have asked me how I got involved with this and why I'm doing what I do. And I, I thought this was a good opportunity to say that, that really all of us have been influenced by the, the passion and commitment that Mary has. And uh, I'm one of those, and I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her uh, uh, intense uh, interest, intense desire to help uh, everyone that suffers from PC. So I think we're all very grateful for, for what she's, uh, she's done. So. I think we've already had enough wild applause, but we all, we all, I think, are, have uh, have a heartfelt appreciation for her. So, as you listen to this presentation, I want you to put yourself. Who's this? That's uh, Janice, right? So we're going to pick on Janice a little bit today uh, because I'm going to show you some of her cells and some of the things that she's done. But I want uh, each of you to kind of put yourself in, in, in her position. And some of the things that I, I, the reactions that I want from my presentation is, is uh, are, are like, uh, okay, so, you know, these are possibilities for you, right? Uh, and uh, maybe uh, most importantly is, uh, is, you know, how can I personally get involved? And I ask myself that a lot. You know, what can I do as a person? What can I do to make this go forward? As, as a team in our company, what can we do to make this go forward? And I think, you know, Mary is really a, um, a great example of the power of one, what one person can do. And I think each of us needs to think of ourselves that way. What can we do to make this, this go forward? 
So uh, Mary asked me to talk about uh, uh, or, or to give you a sense of the worldwide effort that's going on to develop uh, therapies for PC. So what we heard so far in the session is really what's available right now. You know, what kind of specialists can you engage with? Uh, um, uh, what and it's been touched a little bit on some of the things that can help right now. So what we're going to talk about is more the basic research that's gone into PC um, and and how that's how that knowledge that we're gaining is being applied to try and develop new therapeutics, things that can really get at the root cause of PC and hopefully make a difference in the quality of your life. So this is a, a slide that I stole from Mary, and I think she'll show it. So uh, it's a good one to, uh, to get familiar with. So these are my, uh, I think this battery is dead, but so these are some of the folks around the world that are involved in uh, PC research. So we're all part of what's called the International Pachynechia Congenita Consortium, or the IPCC, and this is a group of physicians and scientists that have agreed to work together to develop therapeutics. And um, if you look at some of the names up here, uh, you'll notice that some of those names are in this JID issue that Mary provided to you. Some of these are publishing these articles in this journal. And as um, uh, Dr. Bravo mentioned, uh, the Journal of Investigative Dermatology is the number one dermatology journal in the world. So an incredible amount of emphasis and spotlight is being put on PC right now. And, and it's because of you and your efforts and, and the efforts of PC Project that that's, uh, uh, that's happening. So I asked, I sent an email around to a few of these folks and asked them to send me a few slides showing their personnel and, and some of the things that they're doing. And um, I just want to point out some of, uh, of these. So first of all, Transderm, uh, met, all met Robin. Um, we have about six or seven people that work at Transderm. And uh, we're divided into many different divisions. And we have a crack design division that, um, that designed these uh, sweatshirts. Okay. Uh, so so one, one branch of our company worked on these sweatshirts. Right? So I actually brought uh, a few of these for the raffle and you'll, you'll get, when we made these sweatshirts, we thought it was kind of a fun play on words, give me some skin, give me, give me five. It's become more real than that since then. So we're actually literally asking some of you to, to give us your skin, okay? And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, another crack uh, division of uh, Transderm worked did uh, a movie production that I'll be showing you later in the presentation. And, and my apologies to those of you that are professionals in that area in the audience. But, <laughs> but these are some of the areas that uh, we work on at Transderm. So we're very interested in making sRNA therapeutics. I'll tell you a little bit uh, uh, more about that as we go along. We're intensely, keenly interested in how we deliver those uh, to the skin and we have topical formulations that we work on and we have microneedle arrays and we'll show you, actually literally show you these microneedle arrays and, and show, you the, show you how those work uh, later on. We also spend a lot of time on intravital skin imaging. This is a way to see what's going on inside of the skin without doing any damage to the skin or to the, or to the patient, whether that patient be a human patient or a mouse patient, which is usually what we're working with. And one thing that I'm not going to say very much about, and maybe Mary or somebody else later on will talk about uh, some of the clinical trials that are planned. And one of the ones that we work on uh, is rapamycin, which is a drug that's used uh, to suppress the immune system uh, following organ transplantation. So those of you that know people that have had some kind of an organ transplant may know that they're on rapamycin. Rapamycin has a lot of properties and it turns out that one of those is that it inhibits um, some of the genes that are involved in PC and it may be a great way to alleviate some of the symptoms if we can figure out a way to deliver it topically. And there are dermatologists across the world that are, that are studying topical rapamycin now that, and we might be able to use that uh, uh, to help some of you or to, tr to try on some of you to see if it, if it helps. Okay, so just Tycho Speaker is really the one who, who's been involved in the microneedle arrays. 
Um, and I'll tell you a little bit of maybe about some of the other folks as we have time as we go through. So another group that we work very closely with is, is a group at Stanford, so Chris Contag's lab. Chris Contag is an expert in, in intravital imaging. Uh, he's right here. Um, he actually founded a company called Xenogen, which has been bought by uh, other companies subsequent to that, but he was the first one to be able to show that you could measure um, uh, a reporter called luciferase, which comes from fireflies, so these make light, that we could measure the output of that in a quantitative way um, in mouse models. So he uh, has a small animal imaging, uh, he runs a small animal imaging uh, facility at Stanford that we make uh, uh, a lot of use of. Uh, another uh, group is the Dundee group. We're uh, represented very well here uh, by uh, Francis. There she is. And uh, many of you know uh, Dr. McLean, who's been at many of these other meetings. I think he's feeling a little bit uh, uh, bad about not being here because when I asked him to send a slide or two, he sent me Many, many slides, so I'm going to show you a couple pictures of him, so we will fill his, uh, his presence. Uh, we're very fortunate to interact and collaborate extensively with these folks. Uh, one of the things that Irwin has done uh, recently, within the last several years, is he's done a uh, uh, what's called a small molecule screen, where he set up a system to look to see whether existing uh, drugs, small molecule drugs, could have any impact on PC. And he identified uh, uh, a statin, so statins are drugs that are used to treat people that have high cholesterol, and one of these uh, drugs came up in the screen and it looked like it was uh, going to be effective in, in inhibiting one of the genes, at least one of the genes in PC, and that was followed up by a publication, which is again in here, and it's being further uh, followed up by Dr. Hull, who's been running a, a, a study to look to see whether this is useful in, uh, in PC patients. So I hope you can kind of start to get a sense of some of the, uh, the collaboration that goes on. Uh, Dina uh, uh, recently came to Transderm and Stanford to learn some of the techniques that we use there and to share some of the things that she's doing. So there's uh, a lot of... Uh, 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 key areas where we can work together uh, to meet our goals. So I promised you a few pictures of Erwin. You guys recognize him? Remember McLean the Brain, right? So this is not a um, that's not a picture that's hanging on the wall. That's uh, the view out of his window, right? So here uh, he and uh, Francis are uh, analyzing the data. And uh, <laughs> there he is, the man, right? So another group uh, is, that works very closely, uh, we work, that works uh, uh, on PC research is uh, Dennis Roop at the University of Colorado and, and uh, he uh, uh, has an associate, John Chen, who's an MD that, um, that does a lot of the work and is making a, uh, uh, what we call a mouse model of PC. So he's introducing uh, a mutant keratin gene that causes PC into a mouse, so we have a mouse that we can test things on rather than us, right? And uh, so he uh, is very much involved. And here's um, the mouse that they hope has that particular gene, and uh, we're hoping very much that it does as well so that he can share that with the rest of us and we can move forward in that direction. Go ahead, Mary. So his grant was funded in 2005. <laughs> I should, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, I remember having a conversation with uh, Dennis Roop. Dennis Roop is quite a famous scientist. He's a uh, STEM biologist selling people at lunch. Um, where we, we were, were uh, talking about Mary, and, and he said, um, 
you know, I just could never say no to Mary. So I think that, I don't know if he's, I don't, I don't know if he's, a, if he's, he's afraid to say no to Mary or uh, no, no. He, 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 uh, he really wants to help Mary accomplish the goals of that uh, piece of it. So I'll, I'll tell you some more about some of the collaborations as we go through, but I wanted to highlight those at the beginning. So when we started Transform about six years ago, we started it with the the, the, uh, the aim of being a partner with PC Project to develop therapeutics for PC. These were the four goals that we really, uh, or the four areas where we really needed to uh, um, we needed to, to accomplish these. And the first one, understanding the root cause of the disease, we really haven't done anything on because, as you've heard, uh, Francis Smith has, has uh, uh, and others, um, especially in the UK, have identified the mutations that cause PC. And so we're really building on the work that, that they're doing and working with them and others to develop uh, therapeutics based on this fundamental knowledge that they've uh, uncovered. So when we started Transderm, we saw two areas where we thought you know, these are the, the key things that we need to get accomplished. And, and at the beginning, we thought each of these was going to be equally difficult. Okay? So first was to uh, identify potent and specific inhibitors that target the problem genes in PC. Okay? And we wanted them to be very potent and very selective so there wouldn't be any side effects or very few side effects. And then the second was to find effective um, patient-friendly ways, and by patient-friendly what we mean is no pain, little or no pain. Uh, so find effective ways to, del to deliver these inhibitors to the uh, tissues, to the cells that need it. We thought each of these would be equally difficult. The first one turned out to be much, much easier than we thought. Okay? Uh, if you would have told me uh, before we started this, that we would be able to find inhibitors with the potency that we have now and with the ability to selectively target the mutant genes that cause PC, I would not have believed you. It's just been amazing how much progress we've made in that area. Okay, Much easier than we expected. On the other side, <laughs> uh, finding good ways to deliver these at the appropriate concentrations to the right cells has been much, much more difficult than we thought. Okay, And we're not alone in this. Everybody that's, that uses the same technology is struggling with the delivery issue, right? So uh, you know, what, what's holding us up? Delivery, delivery, delivery. And everybody who works in this field will say the same thing. And there is progress being made, but it's not as fast as we would like it to be. And then the final... Uh, step to uh, developing these as therapeutics is to get regulatory approval. And that's a difficult process, but that's very doable, and we don't see that as being a major impediment to our progress. So I've told you about understanding the root cause, um, and now I want to tell you a little bit about, about identifying these inhibitors. And I've told uh, groups and previous patient support meetings about this, but I think that there's enough uh, uh, new folks, and enough of you have asked me about the progress on that, but I thought I would review this uh, as well. And I need to make sure I don't go over time here. So we use a technology that's called RNA interference or RNAi, and this is a very important discovery that was made about 10 years, 10 to 20 years ago now, and in the past 5 to 10 years it's really been uh, uh, people have had keen interest in developing this technology to, uh, uh, to make uh, novel therapeutics. And the idea is that you can make a double-stranded RNA that has the ability to recognize a messenger RNA. Okay? So uh, the messenger RNA is basically the blueprint that is it's, it's sort of like going to the library and taking a, a book out and copying a page that s says how to do something. That's what our messenger RNA is. It's that copy of that book in the, of, the, of that page in the book. And that page has instructions to make a protein. It's like a recipe. 
And what this siRNA has the ability to do is to go and to read these, these, um, these copied pages, and if it sees something that it matches to, then it will destroy it. It, it gets rid of it. And it has, it has an amazing ability to do that. So in our case, it's sort of like saying, okay, we have two pages that have been uh, copied, one from one gene, the father's gene, let's say, and one from the mother's gene. And as Francis said, there's a, ch a change or a mutation, and that's like a single letter being changed. And these siRNAs have the ability to scan these pages and find one that has that single change in it and say, okay, we're gonna burn that one up or we're gonna get rid of that and not affect the good one. Okay, so it has amazing specificity and amazing power. And so what we're, we've done is make these siRNAs that target the mutant keratins that cause PC. And I'm going to skip that in that little movie in the interest of time. You've seen pictures like this so far. And let's turn the lights down a little bit. Ooh. Yeah. This is the ooh and the ah, right? Right, uh, Robin? You can't see it. So what we set out to do is to make an inhibitor that would not have any effect on this wild type where we see the nice keratin um, fibers being made. But inhibits the, uh, the mutated form that causes these aggregates. And so we made a number of these, uh, these inhibitors and tested to find out which ones would be the best. We didn't really know which one was going to work the best beforehand, so we just made all of them and tested them. And just to give you a sense of what's going on here, this is the, these are the, um, the letters in the the wild type with the good gene, and these are the letters in the, uh, in the mutated or the, or the bad gene. And there's just this one uh, change in the letter. So we made all of these inhibitors that target the mutated form and, and shouldn't affect the, the wild type. And when we did this test, when we evaluated how well they were going to work, we looked at its effect on both the good gene and the bad gene. And in this case, the uh, good gene is the blue and the bad gene is the red. On the x-axis, we're adding increasing amounts of our inhibitor. And on the y-axis, we're looking to see how much of the particular genes are being made. So if we look at number 13, as we add more inhibitor, there's no effect on either one of them, right? Are you with me? Okay. In some cases, it looks like they inhibit both of them, but in, in all cases, it looks like the uh, mutant is being inhibited more than the wild type, or the bad is being inhibited more than the good. So uh, here's your test, right? Which one of these do you think works the best? One, number yeah. one, the best? Number 11, number 12? 12. Uh, all right, so we, we, I hear some 12. Does anybody want to disagree with that? Okay, so number 12 looks like it inhibits the bad gene, but has no effect on the good gene. Is that what we want? Is that what you want? Right? <laughs> okay, so this is, we took a few of these, uh, number four and number 12 and, we, and, uh, and number 10, and we evaluated these further, and we eventually settled on number 12 as being the best, and that's the one that we took forward, and eventually a clinical trial was performed. Okay, so those are the best ones. This is just showing the sequence. And this is the experiment that really got us excited. And this is, I think, what has incredible relevance uh, to you folks. So we did this experiment. We did it in culture, so it's not in mice, it's not in people. Um, and we call this a tissue culture model. And we learned earlier this morning that this is a dominant disorder. And what that means is we have a good gene and a bad gene. And if it's dominant, which one of those is going to uh, going to win in a fight? The, the bad gene, right? So if we mix the, the good gene, which is our wild type, with the uh, mutant gene and we express those proteins, which one is going to win? Are we going to see nice, beautiful filaments? No, we're going to see these aggregates, which we believe cause all of the problems. And that's exactly what happens when we, when we do this type of experiment. If we now add uh, a non-specific or an irrelevant inhibitor, um, we see the same thing as if we don't have that inhibitor there. We have these aggregates being formed. But now if we come in with one of our siRNAs 
that selectively inhibits the mutant form but doesn't affect the wild type, we're still putting the same things into these cells, and each of these cells has a blue nucleus, so you can kind of get a night. This is two cells here, and this is one cell um, in this case. If we, when we put in our sRNA that, that blocks the bad gene, now only the good gene is being made, and instead of seeing these aggregates, what do we see? See, we see those nice keratin filaments, right? So this is a good place for our, uh, you know, for our ooh and ah, right? <laughs> so so uh, this is just a, a demonstration on how selective these, uh, these siRNAs are, okay? And what we really want to do is get these siRNAs into the keratinocytes in your feet, for example, and if we get them in at the right concentration, which is not very much because these are so potent, we get them into those right cells, they will block expression of that bad gene, and you'll only have the good gene, and you should go from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. So if you see something that looks like this, you should think pain, right? You see something that looks like this, you should think, ooh, yeah, <laughs> that's what I want, right? <laughs> okay, so that's really what we're trying to do. So we took these these results and we um, we went to the FDA and and we uh, we asked for permission essentially to test these in in PCs and we received permission to do that in in one person so our, our drug our if you remember the number 12 it became renamed as we as we made it under conditions that, that could be used in humans and uh, and was was formulated in, a, in a, a saline solution that was very clean. It now becomes TD-101, so that's the name of our drug. And this was an investigator-initiated trial uh, performed by Sansi Leachman at the University of Utah. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but we had to write uh, clinical trial protocols, and these were blinded, and, and treatments were twice a week, and we can talk more about that. And, and uh, the patient in this particular case was uh, Janice uh, Schwartz, and so you can talk to her about her uh, experience with that. I should say that there are a lot of confidentiality issues, and I say her name because she's given me permission to say that. I wouldn't say that anything about any of you uh, without, your, without your permission. So this was a, a, a dose escalation trial, which means that small amounts were, were uh, delivered first, and the way we delivered these was through what we call an intradermal or an intralesional injection. So now think about that. Think about how, how uh, painful your feet are and how painful the lesions are. Uh, she needed to have uh, regional um, nerve blocks and oral pain medication in order to uh, withstand the pain associated with that. But the, um, we needed to do this because we needed to find out, number one, if it was going to be uh, uh, tolerated well. So was there going to be uh, an immune reaction? Was there going to be some other issues that came up that we needed to know about? And secondarily, we wanted to see if we could see some efficacy, if, if we could see some improvement in those lesions that were injected. And just to uh, skip to um, uh, the, the part that I think uh, most of you would be most interested in, there were a number of measurements to look at whether or not something was happening with this particular drug. So one foot had a lesion that was injected with the siRNA. The other foot received just what we call the vehicle alone. This is just a saline solution that the siRNA inhibitor was in. Uh, when the study was unblinded, it turned out that the, the, um, the, the red was just a saline solution and the blue was the siRNA. And what you see here is increasing amounts of the inhibitor that was added. So I hope that you can see that as we started to increase the dose of the uh, drug over time, something was really happening in the foot that was receiving the sRNA. The size of the callus, which we're measuring here, seemed to be going down as we increased the, the concentration of the sRNA. But I think what was most gratifying to, uh, to Jan and to the people that were involved was in this area that we call the bullseye, and this was marked at one point with uh, uh, a marker, um, a permanent marker. So there's a, a circle here, and, and the siRNA was injected right into the middle of it. So here's what this callus looked like at the beginning of the study, and after uh, we got to doses that were high enough so we're delivering sufficient amount of drug, 
this area in the bullseye area seemed to clear, and instead of seeing the normal thick callus, it looked like it was reverting back to healthy pink skin. So that didn't happen on the vehicle control. And Janice was quite funny about it because she would invite everybody to come around and touch her at that spot because she said for the first time in her life she didn't feel any pain there. Is Janice in here? She's upstairs. Okay, so I was going to ask her if she would confirm that for me. So this is just one person, right? In the medical community, a study of one person doesn't really carry a whole lot of weight, and so it looks very promising. These results were very encouraging and looked very promising to us, but we really need to move forward and to get to the level where we find other ways to deliver that aren't so painful and to do it in larger numbers of people so that we know that this isn't just some kind of a freak accident that this happened. The fact that she had never seen clearing in that area of her foot in her life meant a lot to her and to many of the rest of us, but nevertheless, in order to be able to really make strong statements about the effectiveness of this, we need to move forward. So as I mentioned, the big problem with this approach was the act of injecting was incredibly painful, and large volumes were injected. So think about generating all of this pressure in these lesions. Very, very painful, and really we're very grateful to her for putting up with this and getting to the point where we felt comfortable moving forward to develop other delivery technologies that don't hurt. If I could just say something. It was absolutely awful. I mean, I don't know what you guys were thinking, but it was absolutely awful. So she's made a video, and some of you have seen that and some of you haven't, and I would encourage those of you that haven't to look at that. It's on the web. Sam, I didn't mean to make light of the pain. It's actually difficult for me to even talk about that because I like to think of myself as making the quality of life better for people, and certainly during the time that she was being treated, her quality of life was greatly diminished. And she's one of my heroes for having done that and suffered through that. So obviously we don't want to put anybody else through that. So our next point is finding these patient-friendly and translate that to be pain-free or little pain ways to get these in because we sincerely believe that if we get these into the cells, that they will work. That's the take-home that I really want you to have is we have the inhibitors. We have the drug that will work. We just need to figure out how to get it in. Is that permanent? It's not permanent. So after the treatment was stopped, then the symptoms reoccurred. What time? I'm sorry, I kind of lost. Five minutes. I have five minutes. Wow, okay. So I need to get through some of this very quickly. So we've been focusing on delivery. We've had meetings on delivery. We've written papers on delivery. We've asked for money from the government to fund looking at delivery to skin. That was awarded. We had formed a consortium to look at nucleic acid delivery to skin. These are the aims, which are in scientific language. I won't go through those, but I just want you to see that this is happening. Here's a meeting that was held with this consortium at Stanford two years ago. Here's the group that came together last year. That shouldn't be 2010. That should be 2011. There's a number of scientists and physicians that are really looking 
hard at how to, how to find a, a good way to deliver. We've looked at quite a number of, of delivery technologies. I've listed some of these here. We don't have time to go through them. Um, what has turned out, what we really want to work well is these topical formulations. What our dream is is to have something that's like a, a sunscreen that you would rub on the bottom of your feet. It would go penetrate through there. It would, would inhibit the uh, mutant form, but not the wild type. That's our dream. We're not there, we're, we're, we're trying to make our dream a reality. What does work, uh, um, what we've really focused on at this point are um, a couple of things. Um, these microneedle arrays, I'll show you some examples of those in just a second, and, and uh, like a version two of the sRNA. So these um, sRNAs have, uh, um, have uh, things added to them so that when they get close to a keratin site, they get taken up. Okay, so we don't need the pressure that we needed in in the uh, in the clinical trial in order to get get them to be delivered. This is really uh, uh, a big deal, and uh, and if you look at the uh, uh, the JID issue and you look under Robin's name, you'll see an article that was written uh, showing that these self-delivery sRNAs can be taken up. Uh, by skin cells, and, and it's a very uh, big step forward that we've made. So what we're doing is we're combining these self-delivery sRNAs with other technologies. Microneedles is uh, what we are um, uh, uh, focusing at present, and I'm going to skip some of these, but these are some of the intravital imaging that we've done. We can actually see individual cells uh, that are expressing different genes that we introduce. Uh, in mouse skin, where we just have the mice sleeping and they're not hurt at all by this procedure, and we're able to uh, to visualize these different uh, uh, cells. So here's an individual cell that is expressing a fluorescent protein, and you can see the dark nucleus in the middle. Sorry to go so fast through these. Here's an example where we uh, have introduced uh, a fluorescent protein that has been linked up to our mutant K6A, and we can put these into uh, mouse foot pad skin and we can actually see the aggregates that are being formed um, uh, within an individual cell and what we're using this technology to to be able to go back in and now add the sRNAs to look to see if we can get rid of those aggregates and just see the nice keratin uh, strands being formed. So um, to in our very simplistic way of thinking about how do we deliver these to skin. Number one, we have to get it past that barrier. So our, our, our bodies have this incredibly good barrier on the outside and we call that our skin, right? The outer layer of our skin. It's also called the stratum corneum. We need to figure out how to puncture through that. In the clinical trial, we did that by injecting with a, with a needle. And then we need these inhibitors to be taken up by the cells that are expressing the mutated keratins. And I mentioned these self-delivery modifications, and we feel like th this is not uh, a barrier to us anymore. We feel like we've solved that. The, the one that we're, that we're uh, most lacking in is getting it past that outer barrier, that, that which, which uh, separates the outside world from, from us. And uh, that's really a, a, a very strong barrier. So. These are the things that we've really been successful or worked on at Transderm, These, the injections, the microneedle arrays, and I talked about the topical application, which isn't working as well as these other two at this point. Let me skip these. So these are the microneedle arrays. So Robin, if you want to come up here, and we brought some examples of these arrays uh, that you can come up during the break and we can show you, but we wanted to give you a, a quick demonstration of how this would work. So we've loaded uh, uh, one of these microneedle arrays with fluorescein. <clears throat> so fluorescein is what's in a yellow highlighter. Everybody's used a yellow highlighter, right, to highlight uh, their book or whatever. And, and that contains fluorescein. And fluorescein is an approved um, reagent for, uh, for human use. Um, this is not uh, an approved device for human use, but uh, um, what we what we have done is we put the fluorescein in and we've accidentally poked ourselves with these. This 
Uh, we don't want to get in trouble, right? And, and we look to see how well they deliver the fluorescein. And, um, Should I accidentally poke you? Okay. Uh, I, so, even though it's, it's pretty hard to believe that your epidermis where you have the, um, uh, the keratinocytes that, that express these mutant proteins that cause all of this pain, uh, these, this layer of the skin doesn't contain uh, nerve cells. So if I puncture this into my epidermis, I really can't feel it. It feels sort of like a, um, a cat is licking me. The, the tongue kind of grabs in, into my skin, and that's kind of what it feels like. And so the idea is, can we load these microneedle rays, can we load the tips of them, uh, can we load the tips of them with these siRNAs and deliver them this way? Okay. And so I want you to think about that in your particular case. Could you uh, push one of these microneedle rays on the border of where you have one of the lesions? And presumably, what our, what our theory is, is that the tips would penetrate uh, into the epidermis, and then when we pull this off, um, the tips will be left behind, and they'll act as a reservoir for the drug, for our sRNAs. Okay? And, and we know that these sRNAs will diffuse laterally within the skin. And so if we put them at the border of a lesion, we hope that some of that will move into the lesion. It'll start to correct it there. And hopefully if it's working well, that lesion will get a little bit smaller. And as we keep treating, we'll be uh, going farther and farther in, kind of like a lake that's drying up. The water will recede and you're able to get closer to the lesion, right? And then it'll get dry up a little bit more, you'll be able to get closer to right. it. See right there? Can you see him? Oh. 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 <laughs> so you okay. see all the individual... So Mary, do I have do I have three minutes to get to uh, Jan's? Okay, all right, all right. So sorry that I'm I'm a little bit over time. I got a little carried away, I guess, before. So. Um. Okay, so and here's kind of what here's here's an example of a of a needle before it goes in. After it goes in, the tip has gone inside, and, and this is what's pulled out. Okay. So, again, our goal is to uh, combine the microneedles with these self-delivery sRNAs and, uh, and have something that, that will uh, be able to get the inhibitors to the right cells. So, uh, the last thing that I want to tell you about is using human skin uh, on, um, uh, as something that we test uh, delivery on. And, of course, we don't want to do this to, to you or to me. Um, uh, we want to have other ways to test it before we actually use it. So one of the things that we've done is we've taken uh, a product from a company that's called the Human Skin Equivalent. This is essentially like skin that, uh, that burn patients would receive. And we take this skin that, that, that companies can make and they sell, they <clears throat> sell and we put it on a mouse whose immune system is, is, is uh, not working well so that it doesn't reject the human skin. And when we do that and we use our microneedle arrays and, and we put in inhibitors that target different genes like CD44, we can get inhibition. So here's without treatment and after we treat we get about a 50% inhibition uh, of the targeted genes. But what we really want to do, and this is another one of the articles that's in that JID issue, is to make skin that has PC characteristics. And so what we can do is we can take a biopsy from, um, from a patient and we can grow the cells, the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts that are the main components of skin. We can grow those in culture and then we can uh, reconstitute them, allow them to differentiate so they make skin and we can graft that on a, on a mouse. And we can test delivery of our agents or how well they work on this, on this mouse. So we've got essentially if you were to donate skin, we would have uh, reconstituted skin that's the exact genetic makeup of yours that's sitting on the back of, of, a, of a little mouse. 
And these are the type of mice that, that Jake takes care of that, uh, that Mary was talking about yesterday. Um, I had this special assignment that I gave to Rebecca to make a very quick movie, and I forgot about this as well. It takes like four minutes. You guys want to see this movie? And then I promise we'll quit after that, okay? Uh, and so my, my, uh, uh, my <clears throat> uh, what I told her was we need to explain to folks uh, what it's like to have a biopsy taken. And we had taken biopsies from uh, some PC patients, and Jan was one that we took uh, a biopsy from. And when we were doing that, and when I was processing the samples, Mary said, you know, we really need to show this to all the other PCers so they know what it's like. And so we needed a control, someone who didn't have PC, so I decided that my skin was as good as any control. And so I went and had a biopsy, and, that, and what this movie is about is showing you uh, what it's like. Okay? So... Uh, the last speaker took his foot off, or his shoe off to show his uh, orthotics. I'm going to show you pictures of my foot, so. So this is Jean Tang, who's a dermatologist at Stanford and, and uh, one of her residents. So don't look if you don't like needles, okay? So basically what's happening here is they're injecting me with lidocaine, which is very similar to what you would get if you uh, were to go to the dentist and have a filling done. So they're numbing me up so I won't feel it. They're going to actually show taking the biopsy, so there's going to be a little bit of blood here if you don't want to see it. Turn your, uh, turn, close your eyes. Can you hear me say no? Okay, here comes the blood. Close your eyes. Close. That's Becca. Okay. So that was a four millimeter biopsy. They took another one right next to it, which was a mistake. I should have had them take it farther away. Uh, that was my miscommunication. Here they're stitching me up. Normally, you'd only get one or two stitches because these were right next to each other. I got four stitches in that area. I told Rebecca to show pictures of me being happy and telling jokes. She didn't get those in there, but that really didn't, uh, wasn't that dramatic for me anyway. There's my skin that we've now collected in liquid. Okay, we're off. <laughs> Okay, no, sorry, hold that thought, Mary. I'm going to be isolating keratinocytes from a four millimeter punch biopsy that's been cut in half. That is half of the four millimeter punch biopsy. It's been incubating in this space to separate the dermis from the epidermis. So the epidermis has the keratinocytes. The dermis has the fibroblasts. So now we're going to put the dermis in trypsin. It's kind of characteristic of the dermis is that it's kind of loopy. Loopy is a scientific term. Here 
cells are in the plate, and we put them in the 37 So that's just an incubator that keeps it at the right temperature and the right pH. And there they will stay. Okay, so it is now about 26 or 27 hours since I had the biopsy taken from my foot. So the anesthesia finally started wearing off yesterday, about five or six hours after it was given to me. And then I felt some pain, but mainly when uh, there's pressure on it, so I have absolutely no pain uh, now. When I walk, I try not to walk directly on it because I don't want to pull the stitches out. So I don't really know exactly how painful it is. So here's what the wound looks like. Becca, don't faint. Uh, so there's a little bit of oozing in blood, it looks like. I actually took a shower this morning, but tried yes. not to get it wet. So that's what it looks like right now. It looks like they have plenty of stitches in there. And so on the dermatologist's recommendation, I'm just gonna put a little bit of Vaseline on there. Put that in a little bit. Hopefully that's not too gross. And just put a Band-Aid on top of that. So, so far so good. I'm already a little bit impatient about uh, it healing. <laughs> uh, it told me 10 days to two weeks before we take the stitches out. I'm hoping that it will be a little bit faster than that, but we'll have to see how things go. But so far it looks good. I don't see any signs of infection. There's no uh, pain associated with it. I really can't feel it at all. And when I walk, just sort of walking uh, so that I don't uh, tear those stitches out. Thank so you for your sacrifice. So just a uh, couple other pictures. Here's a uh, picture of the biopsy. And I wanted to show you what the cells look like after they've been growing. These are actually uh, uh, Jan cells that were taken about a week before her biopsy was taken about a week before mine. This is another time for the oohs and ahs. Doesn't Jan look great, you know? Doesn't she have great looking skin cells? Uh, and these are still growing well, and we're very pleased with how well they're growing. Uh, sometimes we take biopsies and the cells die. And we're very frustrated about that, and we feel terrible uh, having to go back and tell people that the cells didn't grow. And um, I know from personal experience now what that's like because despite our best efforts, we couldn't get the keratinocytes to grow from my biopsy. So um, biopsies don't always work. Ouch. Last slide. We, uh, we've made progress, uh, and I'm here to tell you that we've made progress. Uh, sometimes we worry that when we talk about progress, we give a lot of hope. And, uh, and, and sometimes what happens in the medical community and with research, false, hope is, uh, false hopes are raised. Don't want to do that. We still have a ways to go. But we're, uh, we feel like we see the sun rays you know, coming over the, the mountainside. This is taken from, from uh, Mary's cabin just outside of her. So, uh, sorry to have gone over time. No, uh, but uh, fine. anybody who gives us a biopsy can go over time. <laughs> so one thing that I, some people have told me that I look like I'm limping. It's not from the foot that has the biopsy. I've hurt my knee on my other leg, and that's why I'm limping. So. Stages in it. We want to work out our schedule, but I want a couple of, uh, give you a couple of comments. The place that he took his biopsy, had I been there, would not have been chosen. I, of all the awful places to take it, I, I think there's other soul places that would hurt us. Dr. Hansen should have taken your biopsies because he chooses a much less uh, right. That was an odd place, right, Dr. Hansen? A little bit unusual, but that's Yeah. So Dr. Hansen's done a number of biopsies. Um, also, one thing that we've done is patients who are having surgery on their feet. For example, they're having a, a, podiat a podiatrist do a surgery to correct something. 
we can use skin there, but we have to have someone there to collect it. That's what I started to say. You can't just take it and set it somewhere and put it somewhere and ship it. It's going to be dead. It's useless. We have to have someone in the operating room collecting it in the right medium right then. So we are interested in collecting um, cells to do a number of different things with. Let me know if you want to give me some skin. But we don't want it to be, um, we want it to be um, done with as least disruption, least pain, most, we want to get the most out of it. So we'll coordinate it perfectly. Schedule, so schedule. Let me, oh, can I just make one yes, comment? Please. So <laughs> if, uh, if we were asking one of you to give uh, a biopsy from non-PC skin, we would have chosen a different area. So I wanted to know, we wanted to have cells that were as close to where a PC lesion would be as possible. And to give me, I wanted to have kind of the experience of what it might be like to you. To me, my skin is not nearly as sensitive, so it's not nearly the same thing that you would go through. You would have a harder time than I did, but I wanted to at least have a feeling for what but it was PC like. PCs heal, they, they have surgeries, they heal. We've taken biopsies from hips, they heal. Talk with us if you're at all interested. Um, we grow out cell lines, we do all kinds of things. Some applause, and then we'll make a new step.